Okay. Okay. So for our uh, the people in the audience, uh, if you go to conversations, uh, there's there's typically conversations and people's in session. So with people in session, you know who's there. With conversations, there's particularly chats and Q and A. Uh, in the chats, I think you can put remarks, but if there's a question you would like to be at, see answered at the end of the talk, then it's better to type that into the Q&A and then I can pull that to the stage and then later on, and then you can ask your questions and we can mark them as answered. <clears throat> and you can also try to raise your hand if there's really uh, uh, something that needs to be uh, in terms of interruptions. Of course, uh, if the, the speaker wants, they can also react to questions in the Q and A if they can see them. Uh, but I think if there if there's something really that you would like to have immediate reaction to for some reason, then uh, then you do the you use the raised hands facility. Yeah. And we're trying to keep an eye on everything at the same time, and hope that uh, the internet stays afloat. <clears throat> so still a minute to go. We are not in a, I think in a very big rush. Give people the time to, uh, we're now a healthy 33 people with Yu Yu Kong entering. Welcome everybody. And the structure is relatively simple. We have three presentations first, and then we have a break. And then we have the keynote, the first keynote. Then there's a break again. Although it says the keynote is 90 minutes, don't worry, it's only 60 minutes, but this is the way that the system works. The last 30 minutes of the keynote are actually break time. So you don't have to worry about that. And after that, we start with the final th the two papers of today, and then I give a short chair report, and that's the end of today. And then tomorrow we have basically the same setup with, uh, again, five presentations and, an, and a keynote. The idea is that uh, Toby will talk for about 25 minutes, and then there's uh, five minutes time for questions as usual. Uh, but like I said, if you have questions along the way, you can put them in the Q and A, uh, you can put remarks in the chat. And ah, I see uh, Richard coming in. So before we start, I prefer to see if I can make a Richard co-host. Uh, because that means that if something goes terribly wrong on my side with my machine, uh, then he can take over. Right, so you now co-host, Richard. All right, the link is at Haskell Cafe. Let me check if the mail has arrived there. Yes, it has, good. So maybe we'll draw a few more people in. Uh, so I want to start the symposium. So welcome everybody uh, for making it to the Haskell Symposium. Uh, this is a two-day symposium. Uh, both days are not very long, which to some extent is also quite nice because it means that we, I could put all the presentations in an area where most people around the world can actually make it uh, without any uh, losing too much sleep. Uh, the first presenter today is uh, Toby Bailey, and he will be talking about Chess Cal how to model a two-player game at the type level. Go ahead, Toby. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, welcome, everyone. Hello. Um, yeah, as mentioned, uh, I'm Toby Bailey, and I'm going to be presenting Chess School. Um, so let's get started. So the way that Chess School was born was, if you play chess terribly, like me, you're always being corrected by your opponent. But you know, what if instead of that, you were corrected by a computer program? But what if instead of that, you were corrected slowly by a compiler? And uh, so chess school was born. So here we can see a valid move by a white pawn in the game of chess. Uh, you don't need to know chess for uh, this talk, by the way. I'll explain any relevant rules as and when they become relevant. So yeah, here's a valid move by a white pawn from uh, square E2 to square E4. And we express that in chess school as follows. 
And um, if you compile this game with GHC, it successfully compiles with no problems. But here's an invalid move. They're moving to square E5 that they're not allowed to move to. And we express that in the same way. You know, the pawn's moving. We specify the origin square and the destination square. But this time, this particular game won't compile with the type error, saying that there's no valid move and pointing you instead to where the pawn could move. So Chess Course started off as my third year dissertation project. It contains a full type level model of all uh, International Chess Federation 2018 laws of chess, uh, the ones that concern the game, that is. And it comes with a Haskell EDSL to interact with that model. And, you know, of course, Haskell's type features made this a really smooth process, right? Well, no, it did not. Uh, there were a few hurdles, and uh, this talk is going to take you through some of the interesting hurdles and some of the interesting problems we faced. So first of all, let's do a little comparison. This is beloved open world game The Witcher 3 at the highest graphical settings. And uh, here is a 10 move chess school game. So the memory usage of The Witcher 3, it's about three and a half gigabytes on average. That's pretty good. You know, it's got an open world, lots of dynamic actors. And uh, here it is next to the memory usage of Cheskul. Um, so as you can see, Cheskul's memory usage was a bit of an issue during, uh, during development. Uh, at the core of Cheskul, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of how Cheskul works. At the core of Cheskul is a central type family move that basically takes in the board state it spits out a board state in which the move has been made, and you pipe these together ad infinitum. So a value level equivalent could very well have this type of signature. You know, you take in the origin square, the destination square, the current state of the board, and it tells you the new state of the board where the move has been made. So to have the code be as idiomatic and reusable and clean as possible, we looked for a solution to pass application that type of. And unsaturated type families are uh, really exciting, but unfortunately, they're not available yet. And so in the meantime, we chose a different solution. Uh, first class families devised by Li Yaoshi. And uh, I'm just going to briefly introduce that and give an overview. So as we all know, you can't partially apply type families, but you can partially apply type constructors. So let's say that you want a partially apply, you want to be able to partially apply an addition function at the type level. So you make a data type uh, to hold the arguments but you need something of kind star. So you define a new type X from A to star, which allows you to basically hold all of the arguments for this function, but you still need a way to evaluate those arguments. And that's where an open type family called eval comes in. And you define an eval instance for those arguments, and then you're able to partially apply them. And of course, if you want to evaluate it, you just call eval on the argument list, which is wrapped up in your custom type. So with the following definition of map and a definition of our own version of type level plus, we can now map over lists at the type level, like so. So in chess school, each turn of movement is expressed as a first class family. So here's that move function that we were talking about earlier. It's a first class family here, origin position, destination position, current state of the board, and it returns the new state of the board. And thanks to the use of first class families, we can extend this with rule checking rather naturally using a type level version of function composition. So from right to left, you have the pre-move checks, the move itself, and then the post-move checks. And uh, as for the Cheskal EDSL itself, we define it using continuation passing style. So we start, we basically define a type spec, uh, which can simplify the type signatures a little bit. And uh, this is the start continuation. It uh, passes in um, a proxy type start deck of kind board decorator into the continuation where start deck describes the initial board state. And we use more continuations to move pieces around the board. Here's one for uh, pawns, just so that you can see. And uh, here's the last continuation that ends the continuation stream and also the chess school game. So uh, now that you have an overview of how chess school works, let's talk about a few of the hurdles. So one of the most common actions in a chess simulation, it occurs at the end of each move, is determining whether one of the kings is in check. Uh, and a king's in check when they can be attacked by a piece of the opposite team. So the old approach for checking whether the king was in check relied on move lists. So here you can see a white bishop at square c5, and I've highlighted all the positions that they can move to. A move list for this bishop would just be a type level list of all of these highlighted positions. 
And the old approach for checking for check would be to get every move list for every piece on the opposing team to the king, use a first class family version of concat to append them all together, and then check if the king position was in that list. And as you can imagine, this old approach was incredibly slow. So to verify how slow it is, here is the definition of the first class family move. And uh, here you can see the check for if the king is in check, check, no check. And uh, here's the pre-move checks and here's the post-move checks. So an eight move chess score game using this old approach would compile in a minute and 37 seconds using 23 gigabytes of memory. But if we comment out the uh, check for whether the king's in check, then that same game would compile in 24 seconds and only using eight gigabytes of memory. So we know for certain that checking if the king's in check is definitely the slowest part of the move. It adds an additional minute to compilation time. So uh, when compilation time, when, sorry, when uh, compilation times grew and uh, we were experiencing some out of memory errors with GHC, we started looking at where we can make some optimizations, bring down memory usage and compile time. And we were trying to think of how we could optimize the check code. And of course, as one of the first things that we're taught, one of the first things that all computer scientists are taught in their undergraduate degrees, you should turn to algorithmic improvements. You know, we're, to talk about, we're taught about big O notation and how you should bring it down. So we started looking into some improvements. So the new approach is essentially to, from the king's position, simulate other pieces movement rules. So here you can see the king at c5 simulating bishop movement. And because it can reach a bishop of the opposite type, that king is in check. So instead of appending together a bunch of different move lists, we would instead compute essentially one extended move list. So this, uh, with the old approach, uh, a 10 move chess school game at the time would cause GHC to crash and run out of memory. But with the new approach, a 10 move chess school game would cause GHC to crash and run out of memory. Um, so while attempting to diagnose why this was happening, why the algorithmic improvements weren't really changing very much, we moved out pre and post move checks into two separate definitions. So here's uh, another definition of move. As you can see, we've moved out a lot of the checks into its own first class family called move with pre checks. And just splitting out the definitions like this caused that 10, 10 move chess school game to compile in a minute and 30 seconds and uh, using only 25 gigabytes of memory. So, you know, the lessons we learned here is that sometimes algorithmic improvements can be less effective than fiddling with the type checker, at least in this case. On to another attempt at optimization, finger trees. Chaskell move lists are, you know, Haskell singly linked type level lists, so appends are on, and these move lists are combined dozens of times each move. So we tried to look for an appropriate data structure with improved uh, append time. So we turn to two, three finger trees. Here's a part of the definition for uh, finger trees at the type level, which we implemented to you know, try and alleviate some of these issues. And we implemented custom first class family equivalents of append, folder, fmap, just so that it could be a drop in replacement for those first class family equivalents that we defined for uh, the normal Haskell type level lists. So uh, after we'd put in the branch with a finger trees, we found that compile time did in fact decrease by a tiny fraction. It decreased by about five seconds. So once again, algorithmic complexity wasn't responsible for the unpredictable compiler performance, but if anyone needs some type level two, three finger trees, you know, go, feel free to ask. So let's talk a little bit about type applications and type signatures. So let's say that you have a declaration, something of type proxy int, and you need a way to assign it an expression of type proxy int. One way of doing that would be, you know, you could use a type application, um, or you could also use a type signature. And in this case, you'd expect the two of them to behave incredibly similarly. Basically, functionally, you'd expect them to do the same thing, right? Well, as we explained earlier, the game begins from some initial board state. So the type start, the type start deck of kind board decorator. And the first version of start deck was constructed in code basically through a bunch of type family applications that were rather expensive, lots of setting the pieces through code rather than writing out the definition. So here is the type, my bad, let me restart. So here is uh, the definition of chess, the first continuation in a chess school game 
and it's using a type application. And uh, this definition, when you compile just this definition on its own, only uses 46 megabytes of memory and compiles in you know close to a quarter of a second. But if you instead uh, use this definition of chess uh, with a type signature, you know you'd expect them to behave rather similarly. But actually, here you can see the memory usage compared between the type signature and the type application version. But uh, the type application version is in fact on the graph. It's just it's dwarfed by it. The type signature version uses almost 26 gigabytes of memory. And uh, it took so long to compile and was starving so many of the other resources that uh, it wouldn't compile. It was sent a uh, sig kill by the OS after three minutes and 10 seconds. So because this behavior is unexpected, we filed a GHC bug report. And in the meantime, we wrote out Stardex definition in full in the Haskell source file. And you can use either definition with no problems. Um, now let's talk about uh, some descriptive error messages. So originally the error messages in Chaskill were intended to include the exact move that violated a rule of chess. So for the incorrect game that you saw earlier that failed to compile, we were hoping that the error message would be more along the lines of explaining the error, but also pointing you towards the exact move that has caused the problem. And uh, we can achieve this by including the move number and the type that represents the game board, the board decorator. So as you can see, the board decorator, it contains the board, but it also contains some useful information, such as the currently moving team, the position of the kings. And here you can see the move number. So we include it in the board decorator. We implement custom type errors in chess school like so. So using first class families again, we essentially just define a first class family wrapper for type error. And uh, we can easily modify this definition to include the specific move that results in the error. So at this time, you don't just pass in the error message, you also pass in the board decorator. And so you return the type error and also um, some extra information at the end, just saying the exact move that caused the error. So here's that same game again. And uh, here it is without the uh, additional move. And without the move number, it's OK, I'm sorry, not without the additional move, without including the move number in the type error. Without the move number, it compiles in 19 seconds and uses 4.5 gigabytes of memory. But when we add the move number to the type error, suddenly it takes almost two minutes to compile and uses 26 gigabytes of memory. But Strangely enough, taking other information from the board decorator, like the king positions, and putting it into the errors doesn't cause similar spikes. The behavior was unpredictable, and we couldn't figure out why. So uh, we turn to our most creative solution yet, and I'm particularly proud of this one. We cut the feature. Cheskill error messages do not contain the exact move that resulted in the type error. And uh, finally, let's talk a little bit about Cheskill shorthand. So here's a comparison between Cheskill syntax and algebraic notation, which is one of the standard ways of describing chess games. Um, and as you can see, the Cheskill syntax, it's noticeably longer and more verbose. And so we were thinking of creating an optional shorthand syntax that people could use if they'd rather you know, express it in something a lot closer to algebraic notation. So essentially, this five mood ga move game would become this in the shorthand. It's a it's a lot shorter. It's a lot closer to algebraic notation. As you can see, you're not specifying the origin square anymore, just the destination square. Um, and you leave it up to Cheskill to calculate the origin square based on the piece that's moving and the destination square itself. And we thought, you know, it'll only be a little bit slower. It's only a little bit of extra work, right? So here is a 10 move Cheskill game. And uh, as you can see, it's using the longer syntax. And this takes three minutes and 25 seconds to compile. But now with the shorthand syntax, it's the same game, but now we're not specifying the origin square. This takes one minute and 20 seconds to compile. It's under half the compile time, and we see similar reductions in memory usage just through this uh, the implementation of this shorthand. And we were thinking, you know, this could be because there are fewer continuations. But um, no, unfortunately, uh, we, we're still not entirely sure for the exact cause of the improvement, because here's the shorthand when compared in terms of memory usage against other non-CPS versions of the code that rely on function composition and function application, respectively. And um, 
more than two moves, the games that we tested were only two moves, because if we expressed games that were longer than two, move, two moves, then GHC would crash when using either of the non-CPS variants. So ultimately, without intimate knowledge of the compiler, without working on GHC, performance is wildly unpredictable, and it's hard to reason about. And it's quite telling that the most dramatic performance improvement in Cheskel was completely unintentional. And so some tools for measuring type level performance or a clearer model of how your code gets executed when you write type level code would be incredibly helpful for those who are uh, writing code yeah, at the type level in Haskell. And um, additionally, one of the reviewers of the paper suggested uh, avoiding the move list approach. So instead of searching through move lists um, for each move, we take into account the fact that behavior at the type level is strict and those lists aren't going to be lazily evaluated. And so we generalized the ray-based approach, approach for check to be used for all move calculations in chess. So uh, here is a bishop at a7. And previously, if you wanted to know if a king at c5 was in check, you would get all of the bishop's positions, you'd get the move list, and you would check, is the king's position in that list? So yes, it is. And um, instead of that, we use rays. So to know if a bishop can move to c5 at all, and not just for check, uh, we shoot out a ray from c5, mimicking bishop movement, just like we did earlier for the check code. So you send out the rays in each direction, one by one. And so to know if a bishop can, in fact, move to c5, in this case, we only shoot out one ray, so we don't have to consider the rest of the positions. And it's a, you know, a net reduction in the amount of work that you're doing. And uh, the results from using rays, the performance increase is noticeable, especially for pieces that have really expensive move list calculations, like queens who have to basically do all the move list calculation that bishops have to do and all the move list calculation that rooks have to do. And some games that previously were failing to compile because they would run out of memory now, in fact, do so. So here's a 10 move game. And uh, the move list approach uses 30.4 gigabytes and compiles in 110 seconds. But the ray based approach slashes memory usage in half and takes a fifth of the time to compile. But unfortunately, the increases and improvements aren't completely straightforward. So here's a different 10 move game. And the move list approach used about almost 18 gigabytes and compiled in 26 seconds. But the ray-based approach actually saw an increase in memory usage, even though there is a slight reduction in compile time. Overall, across the benchmark suite of the Chesco games tested, performance did improve with, however, a few games were displaying increased memory usage and or compile time. The lesson here is that Haskell idioms, such as searching through a list for something, don't always translate to the type level, and you should take the strict performance into account. But even when you do, performance can still be very unpredictable. One of the big things in GHC9 is talking about compiler performance improvements. But sadly, we haven't been able to test Cheskel and GHC9 to see if uh, any of these improvements bring down memory usage or compile times because of some of the changes to the type checker. Simplified subsumption, subsumption, simplified subsumption does not play well with some of our uh, continuation passing style code. And uh, we're not in a situation where we can easily, um, where we can easily eat or expand some of the types that we're using. But if anyone has some tips for getting this kind of code working with GHC9, uh, please let us know. There is, of course, room to expand Cheskel further. Uh, we could implement a session typed version of it to see how that affects memory usage and compile time, and use it in combination with the existing. Uh, chess school type level chess model. And we could also, to try and bring down memory usage, investigate a type level bit vector implementation using NATs and pattern matching. So currently, as you know, sorry, currently uh, the chess board is basically a vector of vectors. And so that could bring with it some substantial memory usage. And so using just NATs has the potential to bring down memory usage but of course, it would make the code a lot more obtuse and harder to reason about. So in conclusion, we have presented uh, Cheskel, 
a full type level model of chess, which enforces all of the rules in the International Chess Federation laws of chess, bundled with an EDSL for describing chess games and for creating custom chess boards, which uses this type level model for all of its rule checking, and some interesting findings on compile time memory usage, which hopefully will be of use to the implementers and maintainers of GHC. Um, thank you very much. And um, yeah, thank you for listening. And now uh, we're open for questions. Yes. So I'll do the applause. Everybody can just come use the, the pictures. So there's a, there's a few questions lined up on the Q&A. So I'm going to uh, show, uh, pull these to the stage, starting with uh, Rudy Matilla. So this is the question that Rudy poses. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe um, you can answer that question if you can. Yeah, of course. Uh, should I read it out first? Uh, well, I think everybody can read it. So, um, okay. But it's, uh, it's your preference. So um, we ended up testing it on at different stages in development. It would be tested on different devices. Um, the uh, one that we Okay. The one that we tested it on for most of the benchmarking towards the end has 32 gigabytes of RAM. It's a Windows 10 machine. And um, as for some of our tests ending up using swap space, some of them did. Um, on some tests on the Mac operating system, it would go beyond the actual RAM limit of the device and would be extensively using swap space. Okay, so I think this is an answered question now. And the next one I'd like to pull to the show on the stage is by Jeremy Gibbons, but it's actually in two parts. So maybe I'll just invite uh, Jeremy to the stage so he can ask his question live. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jeremy, go ahead. Nice talk, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so part one is on the screen. Uh, you put these outrageous compile times. I, they don't smell to me like they're something to do with the wrong implementation of lists or the wrong implementation of sets or the wrong implementation of intersection or anything like that. But, uh, there's something much more fundamentally taking exponential time when you'd hope it would take quadratic time. And so part two says um, that's something, I, I, don't, I can't tell whether that's because you've accidentally written a quadratic time algorithm in your types or because there's uh, a bug in GHC and, and something there is, is sorry, I, I, you've accidentally written an exponential time thing or whether there's a bug in GHC. Yeah. Did you investigate that? Um, I mean, it seems to me like uh, the quadratic improvements are just uh, moving the deck chairs around and your Titanic's going to sink anyway at the moment. Yeah, I, uh, I, I completely understand what you mean. Um, so we did do some investigating uh, over the course of, so basically several months were spent trying to optimize and bring down compile time and memory usage. And so of course we did some investigating. Of course, there's there's always the chance that I've missed something, but in any of the cases where I spotted um, some of the more egregious examples of implementing things in quadratic or exponential time, as you've said, uh, we did address those. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'll kindly remove you from the stage again, yep. Jeremy. All right. Uh, Mark has answered. So I think the next one I'd like to pull to the stage, a uh, question that I want to get to the stage is by Dominic Porchett. So he says, does en passant ruin everything? It, uh, it certainly came close a few times. Um, so en passant, en passant? Um, I'm afraid I'm still not sure how to pronounce it. I'll say en passant. Um, so en passant capture um, was one of the last rules that we implemented. And uh, it was what led to the use of the board decorator type rather than just the vector of vectors being passed around between the continuations because we needed information on the last move made and um, you know the pieces and how long the game had been going on and that kind of thing. Um, so fortunately, on person capture is a uh, part of Chesskill. It's it's in there. You can compile games with it, and it will fail to compile if you try on person and you mess it up somehow. Um, so no, unfortunately, no. Sorry, no. Fortunately, it doesn't ruin everything, but it was definitely one of the pain points during development. Thanks. 
So another one that got a vote here is, is the following question by Non van der Silk. Do you think GoCal would be easier for GHC to compile? That's a that's a that's a brilliant nickname for it, and uh, you you know maybe uh, you know PhD project right there. Um, I've I personally I haven't tried, so I don't want to. Uh, having seen some of the unpredictable behavior and uh, compilation times, I can't say for certain. But I believe that Go moves are time agnostic, so you don't need nearly as much information about the previous board state as you would with chess. So my gut reaction would be that it would probably be a bit easier um, because you might be able to cut down on the amount of information that you're storing. But I uh, I wouldn't be entirely sure without uh, trying it. All right, thank you. Uh, so there's still quite a few questions lined up. I'm not sure because all the other ones are not yet voted on. So I'm not sure which one to pull to the stage as being most interesting at this point. That's, I, I think it's good that if you later on that you go through all the questions and answer them to the to the people who pose it. But of course, we have a time limitation here. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe we should actually stop at this point so that the next speaker can set up. And I hope you can uh, answer these other questions uh, either through chat or directly to the people involved. So Absolutely. thank you uh, all for your questions and thank you uh, speaker for, for answering them and giving your talk. Uh, I'm going to uh, kindly remove you from the stage.